is Christian Qualin. Like I work at Engine, and I work on a daily basis on the Node.js driver, which I started developing as an open source project about four years ago, and then I joined Tangent about a year and a half ago when Node.js became popular. Um, I worked with MongoDB for about four years, and I'm, I'm, I'm old in this industry, so what I discover every time I go to a meetup these days. Um, the kind of goals that we're going to go through today is like the typical kind of gotchas uh, that we all do when we start out using MongoDB. Like some things that uh, are nice to know, some things that are useful for you when you're developing a model. Oops, that's a little fast. First one, find a modify. How many people that are using find a modify? Know what it is? Okay, I'll, I'll brief, briefly just go through. Find a modify allows you to do uh, a query and an update of a document, and for example, return the changed documents in a single operation. Right. So all the other operations in one of the like insert, update, remove, are basically operations that do return any uh, other other thing that if the operation was successful or not. Right. So if you do an update, it doesn't return the updated documents. It basically just modifies it on the disk and tells you I modified a single document. Find modify lets you update the document and then return the change document, for example. Kind of uh, other options that you have is you can have, for example, uh, set an option called new that will return the new and update the document. Or you can do, for example, an up search, which will basically go and up search a document if it doesn't exist. So if you're trying to do an update and there's no document, it will create a new document. There's also a third option which I'm going to focus on there, but there's a remove option as well, which is query remove the document and return me the document that you removed, for example. So one of the problems, and the reason why is number one, the first one, it has to do with locks. Right? So it's very tempting to use find and modify for every single update operation because it seems to be the perfect operation in the sense that it returns you the document. But it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of the fact that find and modify has to take a write lock during the whole duration of the operation. So, and it's an exclusive write lock. So as you're doing the query <coughs> to fetch the document, and as you're doing the actual write operation or updating the documents, uh, the document, uh, the final modify will take a write lock on your database. So there's no other write operations concurrently happening. A simple update, for example, during a query, uh, query sorry, it will take a read lock, and then only take a write lock during the actual update of the document, which means that you can interleave other operations. That is something to keep in mind when you're working with your code. Yeah? On which level is the lock? Is it collection lock or is it really a database, database lock? Database lock. <coughs> so MongoDB, <coughs> as of 2.2, oh, 2.2? Yeah, 2.2 has database level locking. In the future, it probably will be lower level locking than that, but at the moment, it's a database level locking. So if you're doing find and modify on one database, it doesn't mean that it locks the other databases. It's not a global right lock. So one of the things that can happen is that you can bottleneck your updates. Because of this additional time, you get to hold the write lock for a longer period of time, and you have to deal with the fact that other things cannot write to the database while that's happening. And one of the uh, big problems is typically is that you have a slow query. So when you're doing the find and modify, the first part of it is selecting the document during the update. If that, for example, is causing a collection scan, or it's not using an index, it's just going through the entire collection scan, and that's a big thing. You're basically locking until that query is happening, right? So that has a double impact. And um, another thing is it's always W1, right? So one of the things about find modify is that it's not an actual raw write operation in the sense of actually being part of the wire protocol. It's a command. And by default, it does W1, which means it will just commit to memory. So you cannot do like W2 or W3 waiting for it to replicate across the second years. It doesn't support that. At least not yet. Uh, it's likely we will do this in 2.6, but right now it doesn't do that. <coughs> I actually had a situation where I had to rip some code out. Because what I was doing, I was taking the find and modify <coughs> command in the Node.js driver and pipelining it with a GitLast error. So a GitLab error could potentially check that you actually are writing to multiple secondaries. 
but there are some corny cases that would bite you once in a while with sharding, and so they decided to remove it from the driver because it was causing confusion. So when is it useful? So things where it's useful uh, right off the top of my head is things like a counter. So like say that you are doing an incremental counter, like uh, I want to update this thing and I want to make sure nothing else is incrementing this counter. So that means like given uh, a particular, you have a counter uh, that has a value of one, and you want to make sure that you get the next one in the sequence. So you want to just increment it by one. You want to make sure that nothing else is incrementing it while you're incrementing it, then find modifies the right thing. Because if you then return a result, you're always going to get the right count. Right? So you're locking, updating a counter, and you're getting the result back. Nothing else is updating that counter while this operation is running. Another thing you can use it for is modeling a queue of work. There's lots of like examples of how you can use what's called a cap collection in MongoDB together with find and modify to basically create your own queue. Right? Find and modify lets you basically change the documents and fetch it at the same time. So one typical example is that you might have a value field that's called started, for example, that might be false on a job that has not been picked off the queue. And you're using find and modify to find the first job that is not started and in the same operation change it to be started and returning that document. Right? So you can see how you can actually use that to kind of pull a document out of a collection uh, semantically. Right? Other things you can use it for, for example, is limiting access to a resource. Like if you have five things and you have a document that keeps track of those five <coughs> things that are checked out, <coughs> find and modify lets you basically increment the number of items that are checked out uh, and ensuring that no other operations is able to increment so that you can go over a specific limit. Right? So you basically can say, find and modify uh, this particular document and increment the counter by one if the value is less than, for example, five. Right? And any other operations behind it that's doing find and modify will return no documents, right? If they're, if they're the first operation actually incremented and checked out that value. Second thing that is uh, confusing for a lot of people when you start is write concerns. So how many people here know about write concerns? Right. So write concerns. This is kind of probably, well, this is my, my, my something here. This is my computer. computer. So, a traditional database, basically, when you commit something like in MySQL or Oracle, it goes to memory and then goes to the journal file. And the journal file is an append-only file where it basically takes a transaction and just writes it at the end. Right? So as long as it's been written to the uh, journal, it's consistent. That means that like, if your database goes down, is able to replay that journal from the particular point uh, where the database went down and reconstruct the data. Right? So this is how all databases basically ensure disk-like uh, uh, durability. MongoDB is a little bit more uh, flexible and it's a conscious decision uh, from uh, the creators of the database based on the concept that we, they think that uh, there's a more flexible, there's a need for more flexibility in how you define what is important in the sense of durability. So the first thing that was all the uh, rage about like how um, you could possibly lose your database, uh, your data, was because of this thing called fire and forget. So fire and forget basically means that you write something to MongoDB and you don't wait for any acknowledgement from the database saying that this item was uh, correctly saved. Right? And so if you write a lot to MongoDB, you're eventually going to backfill the sockets, the data that's still waiting to be written out to MongoDB. And if your process dies, anything that's in that socket buffer is gone, right? And so it's very easy to say, oh yeah, MongoDB lost my data. No, it didn't. Your socket didn't empty before your process died. So that's a typical problem that happened with Fire Forget. So most drivers actually had Fire Forget as a default until like about like a year ago. Now they all have W1. <coughs> So W1 basically is the default, and it means that uh, MongoDB will wait until the data is written into memory correctly, and then notify you that uh, the operation was successful. And when we mean W1, it means that in your driver, at the even at the level of the database or 
of a collection or individual operations, you can define what kind of durability you want. So say you're saving lots of analytics and you don't care about durability, you might define W0, which is fire and forget, because if you lose one or two data points, it doesn't matter because the whole the, the big picture is the important thing. But you have an important record that you need to ensure is written correctly, and the user is clicking and adding something to a profile, for example. W1 will give you, for example, uh, will give you uh, acknowledgement that it was actually correctly written to memory. Right? If you need uh, the durability from a traditional database, then you say J equals true, which is wait until it's committed to journal. So that means that the database will basically return you a success once the journal has been flushed to disk. And that is by default uh, every 100 milliseconds. This is actually the same as Oracle. It's like, so it flushes every 100 milliseconds. But you can kind of change that um, by uh, standard parameters on the MongoD process to, to lower it or put it higher depending on the needs. The next one is basically F-Sync. We don't recommend this because this is kind of uh, very coarse. But it's basically telling wait until the uh, operating system has flush the memory to disk, and this could potentially be fairly uh, unpredictable in the number of milliseconds or even seconds it takes, depending on, on where your system is hosted. And then when we have our cluster system, you have this concept of Ws, uh, where it's either a number larger than one, or it's a tag, or it's a majority. And so when it's a majority, for example, it means that if you have a cluster with a primary and two secondaries, majority means two-thirds in this case. So it means it will be committed to a primary and a secondary before the uh, server returns a successful reply. I'm going to touch into some kind of pitfalls. You can fall into with this as well. Tags is even more complicated, but that basically allows you to specify uh, semantic meanings to, to different things that you need, uh, different right concerns. So you might want to say, um, I want this data to be not only saved in Germany, but also served on, uh, saved on a server in the States. And do not return successful unless this is uh, the case. So the typical uh, my concern, uh, cluster where my concerns become important is the perfect design. So what's the cost of uh, uh, durability? Latency. So for every level of paranoia that you add to your code, you're going to pay in uh, latency because you're going to have to wait longer for the, for the right concern to be true. So the cost of higher safety comes uh, limits your throughput. So there's a, always a cost balance between those things. But because you can kind of like set it on an individual operation, you can have some operations that require high durability and some operations that uh, have lower uh, durability uh, Guarantees. Most cases, W1 is what you're looking for. That is like the why it's default, and it's usually a useful default. One of the problems that people typically do is that they set W to the numbers of servers in the cluster. Right? So if you have a primary and two secondaries, and you set W to three, what happens when a secondary goes away? Right? That work concern can no longer be fulfilled. Right? It's not able to fill it. And that's why the term majority exists. Right? So if you're, gonna, if you're going to lean on the uh, paranoid uh, aspect of wanting to replicate it to as much as a cluster as possible, that's when you use a tag like majority. If you set it to three, you're going to get some in situations where you take down a secondary and your application locks up. Right? You won't be able to write. Also, a lot of people forget about W timeout. W timeout is an option that lets you tell, try to apply this right concern uh, until uh, for a, a maximum of x seconds. Right? So if you set w equals three and you set the timeout of uh, one uh, a thousand milliseconds, then after one second it will fail and it will give an error. So you can kind of control at least um, if there is like some sort of black hole in your network where packets are just going disappearing into the ether because there is a firewall issue or something like that. You can at least make sure that you're not going to hang indefinitely on uh, the W operation. Another thing that people typically do is index duplication. So adding too many indexes is one of the things. Like start writing, you realize that uh, I need an index for this. You add another index, 
uh, and after a while you, you start adding basically compo uh, I'm sorry, composite indexes and they overlap right? so the index A1 and A1, B1 are actually can answer the same questions because a composite can always answer the first key of a composite index can always answer the, the same values as the single index so if you have too many indexes, uh, write, uh, write performance actually drops as well because as you're writing, you need to update indexes and the more indexes you have, the more uh, updates need to happen. So one of the things you should look at is, once you've been in production for a while, is to look at is it possible to consolidate some re-indexes to save some time in writing and also some time in space on your disk. And one of the things you can do, for example, is to consider refactoring your schema. If you find yourself you have a schema and you have 64 indexes, there's probably something wrong with your schema. Another thing is always checking for index usage. So when you're testing out queries, I always use a shell for this. Do DB, for example, in this case, the database test, uh, or the collection test, do find and then explain at the end. That will give you back a result that tells you uh, what the database server did in, in trying to resolve this. Um, Query. And if you see basic cursor in there, it's mostly likely a problem, unless it's a very small question, because that means that the database is actually going through every single record in the database to answer that particular query. It's really, really useful as well if you're ops to check queries. Right? If you got slow uh, queries in your logs, this is extremely useful to go back and look at what exactly is this query doing in the database. This is similar to like relational database and query plans, right? It's the MongoDB version of that. One of the things that um, also a lot of people do at the start is what we call among arrays. So if you have a very, very simple analytic model here, this is just like a measurement array with time, right? Examples of typical analytics. Uh, you're constantly growing your collection in documents, and you're also constantly growing individual documents. Right? As you go, you keep on adding measurements in a single document. Right? So this actually is mostly at scale where you get the impact of this. Because what happens is that you run into a couple of things. The first thing is that each document gets a maximum of 60 megabytes. So after 60 megabytes, you're going to get errors because you can no longer update the documents. As you are actually adding documents continuously to it, uh, the database will actually, uh, the document will no longer fit in the memory allocated by MongoDB. Right? So it will allocate a piece of memory somewhere, write the document in there, and add what we call a padding factor, some empty space around it, expecting the document to grow somewhat. But as you're just adding to the document, it will basically grow, 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 and keep, be kept moving around. Like, so it will have to allocate a new space, copy the whole document there, and then keep doing that again and again. And see, every single document is actually growing all the time. The database is not able to find what is a good acceptable padding factor to add to uh, a new document to make sure that uh, it actually doesn't uh, that it can grow in, in the initially allocated space. And the real thing you will see that is when you look at database stats, you will see something like your padding factor is more or less equal to two. That means that it's given up in trying to uh, figure out exactly how big uh, your documents are. And this has a severe impact on throughput because the more it needs to move documents around the memory and write them, the, more, uh, the less time it has to actually write new documents to memory. A lot of the uh, ways you can kind of uh, deal with this is what we call bucketing. So bucketing is a way of basically <coughs> taking a, a document and splitting it up by some sort of group key. So in this case, for example, a bucket is defined for 1997 0101, so it's the month of 1990, uh, January 1997. And all the measurements for that particular month are in this bucket. Right, so that means that each document represents a month. They're going to grow to some particular set size unless the database optimizes the, the actual allocation. So the typical things you people do for analytics, for example, is split by month, or day, or week, or even hour. Right? So you split up the documents, and then you are able to query on ranges still, because you can just say, give me these buckets for this particular time period, and then you can do uh, aggregation across those. 
Five is JavaScript. JavaScript is probably the most abused part of the server. Anybody here use Dollar where? Yeah? All right, don't. <laughs> <laughs> so Dollar where cannot do indexes. The fair thing is that some people do have a valid use for Dollar where because there is this thing like, for example, you say you want to compare documents based on two fields in the same document. Right, so you have field one and field two, you want to make sure that they're also two equal in the query. You can't do that with the query language as is. Um, maybe in the future, but right now you can't. So you have to drop into where. Right? Uh, finally, it's like, where can I use any indexes? Because there's no way for the JavaScript engine to tell whether it be that I need to use this particular index to search. Right? It has to basically go through every single document because it, it's a basically a query on every single document. So it causes a table scan on everything, and it packs performance pretty badly. Like, so if you have a big collection, it's going to be bad. If it's a very small collection, it probably doesn't matter. If you have 100 documents and you're doing a where, probably will have really, really little impact. But on big uh, collections, you're going to have a problem. If you need to use it, then make sure you narrow the query first. Like, so the first part of the query should be something that will use an index. And then the second part, it can be a where, which will be a filter on those documents returned. Other thing that a lot of people do is write JavaScript store procedures. It's also a bad idea. One of the things is that uh, JavaScript uh, function when it executes with eval needs to take a write log for the duration of the call. So it really, truly affects your output because uh, if there's an unknown time, uh, amount of time spent in that JavaScript call. So it's, it's a problematic piece uh, of things. You can't run anything on the secondaries. So these kind of procedures can only be run on the primary. If you try to run this an eval on a secondary, it will fail. Like, it will give you an error. And it doesn't work with sharding. So you here have a scalability issue going forward if you do that. Still, people do it. Like they try to replicate the store procedures from databases and put them in, in JavaScript. No matter how, well she tell, you know, how much you tell them not to. One tip. There's an option called no scripting. Run it, then try your test suite. If it's failing somewhere because it's throwing an error, you probably have a where clause somewhere you might want to have a look at. Uh, I find that uh, I always recommend this to people to put in their staging environment. So if you have an integration test suite uh, that runs against a staging environment, it's valuable to put this on the servers just to catch any possible situations where you, where you have something. And then at least you can be aware of it and like discuss if it makes sense or not to have it. Repreferences is another thing. Um, how many here runs replica sets? Right. Um, anybody here read from their secondaries? Oh, okay, good. So repreferences is a uh, thing that I just read for a <coughs> It's a little bit uh, confusing sometimes. They really only apply to what we call the replica sets and sharded systems, right? So the default ones that you have is something called the primary read, con uh, read concern. Um, read preference, sorry, which is the default, which means that all the queries will go to the master. Right? But you can also uh, specify, I can't even write correctly, you may prefer, primary preferred, um, which basically means that you will look uh, to see if there's a primary. Right? Uh, if it, there is a primary, it will actually uh, read from the primary. If there's not, it will go and look if there's a secondary. So that, this one is kind of meant for the situation where you want to ensure that you can still read even if the primary is down. Like, so you don't want an application to go down even if your primary uh, is down, but you prefer to have the up-to-date data at any given point, which is the master. So this can kind of like help you if, like, for example, you have to step down the primary, it will like at least not stop working, right? It will still execute a query. The data might just be a little bit older than what is on the primary. Secondary is kind of obvious, it's like just read from secondary. And secondary preferred is the inverse of primary preferred. They will go and read their pref uh, secondary uh, if you can, otherwise it will uh, fall back to the primary. A nearest is basically try to find the nearest server to you in ping time, inside of an acceptable latency. So for example, say my acceptable latency for this query is 50 milliseconds, 
a dri the drivers will basically ping all the secondaries come to, uh, like all the time, like well, once in a while, and record the ping time in milliseconds. So if you say my latency acceptable uh, latency period for my read is 50 milliseconds, and one of your server is responding in 200 milliseconds, and the other ones are less than 50 milliseconds, it will exclude the 200 millisecond server from the selection of read candidates. So this kind of has an impact where you, for example, have a replica set and you might have a secondary in some other location, right? So you have one secondary here in Germany, one in, uh, in LA, for example. You have an app server in LA and an app server here. And you want an LA app server to read from the closest servers to itself. So you set the primary latency of 50 milliseconds, right? It's 200 milliseconds to Germany, so those servers will never actually be read from. You can use it for that kind of stuff. Um, that said, nearest is very useful, but if you're geographically distributing, you want to probably look at what we call tags. They're kind of flexible, so most drivers allow you to set them on DB level, collection level, or even individual query. So you can have uh, particular queries that are not time sensitive, like if you have a CMS or something, you want know, to read content and show it, probably doesn't matter if it was just published or if it's tens of uh, milliseconds behind, right? So it's kind of a flexible approach. Typical things where we kind of said like if you're not have, if you don't have time sensitive data, then you should definitely use uh, secondary. I would even go as far as saying that most web applications are not time sensitive in displaying data, and so in many cases it's actually secondary. Is probably the best source unless you're doing something that actually has a direct impact on a user. Right? So, for example, if you're changing a user's password, you probably don't want to read from the secondary. Um, it allows you to scale your reads. So, one of the more interesting uh, ways of using this that I've heard is uh, SourceForge that uh, puts a secondary on each app server. So, their scenario is like 99% read. 1% update, with probably even more, 99.9% .9 read and 0. whatever. Um, so what they've done is just put the secondaries on the app servers themselves and then replicate the data locally to each app server and read from the local uh, data store. So there's like lots of kind of um, topologies you can play around with uh, using this kind of system. Insert update remove is interesting. So. The typical situation where you see this pattern instead of the remove is when you do time sensitive documents. So, analytics is a good example. You insert a record, uh, records, and you're updating a set of records with new data, and then you remove the records after they uh, get invalidated sometime in the future. Right? So, you might only start like the last um, week or last month of data, and anything older than one month you're throwing away because it's an active data store. So, what kind of problems can you get into this? The typical thing is you get fragmentation. As you're basically inserting, updating, and removing, you're creating all these like blocks of memory that uh, could be hard to reuse by the server because they're kind of specifically sized to those individual documents. <coughs> and you might run into periodic impacts because you're going to be probably doing bulk removes, or you're just taking a bunch of data and deleting it. Right? And while you're deleting it, you're doing um, basically a write operation, a write lock, a write lock on the database. So people go around this by basically deleting small chunks at a time continuously, for example. But it increases a lot of uh, complexity in your code and your maintenance. So as I said about fragmentation, um, as the allocator is uh, creating this documents with padding factor, you get these unevenly sized blocks. And, and the free list, which is the list of all these uh, empty blocks, gets kind of fragmented. So here's a possible way you can at least reduce the fragmentation. There's this possibility of creating, um, you can create a basically modify collection. So you, you create a collection and then you modify it uh, using use power of two sizes. Right? So this is a command probably very few of you know about. Anybody know about power of two? One, two, yeah. So this one is really good. Actually, I'm, I'm championing uh, internally for us to make this the default allocator. Because it can possibly waste a little bit of memory, but uh, the fragmentation issue is nearly gone when you use this. So it's a very simple comp uh, uh, 
context, right? Uh, idea. Basically, it just takes, uh, for example, and allocates by power of two. So it has allocations of maybe 128 bytes, 256 bytes, 512, 1024, 2048, etc., etc., right? Up to 16 megabytes. So the, the problem, obviously, is that you could lose some memory if you, for example, document is 257 bytes, it will allocate 512 bytes, right? But on the good side, it means every single block is probably reusable more easily. So if you allocate a document, a uh, uh, block of 1024, and all your documents are between the range of 512 and 1024, there will, it, it will always find a block to actually write the document into. So as, it's, as, as you're actually uh, updating and removing, uh, this free list can more easily reuse those blocks from new documents, right? Because they're not perfectly aligned to the size of the documents. So the effect of this is lower, lower fragmentation. Uh, the hard part, uh, the possibly bad thing is some waste of, of space. But I think it kind of, the fragmentation kind of outweighs the possible waste of uh, documentation space, or space for documents. Uh, another thing, uh, as we said, was bulk remove. So if you're removing all the documents, it uh, can cause serious throughput issues. For that, uh, there's uh, in 2.4 time to live indexes. Anybody know about these? So many? No, no, maybe. Not many. There's a special new index, which is awesome, especially if you deal with time uh, sensitive data. So if you create an ensure index, or in this case, for example, a status, and expire after uh, th uh, 3,600 seconds, first of all, it only works in date fields, right? So you can set a date, was created on or updated on, and the index will basically gradually remove documents over time once they fall outside of this uh, time period. So if you have data that you just want to keep around for a month, you can set the expiry to be basically a month in seconds, and any documents that like are over that period will just be silently deleted by the database. It's not a hard removal deadline, right? So if you set one second there, it's not going to be deleted in one second. It's going to be deleted when the database have time to actually do the deletes. So it might be a minute, it might be 30 seconds, it depends. Uh, I would wish it was that hard, uh, that long, but it's not, unfortunately. But still then, it's incredibly useful to get rid of this bulk removal issue. Uh, so at 8, we're getting close to the, the end here. The query. One of the things typical, and I did it myself, is uh, <coughs> replacing a whole document. So you have a situation where you actually wanted a document that said A1, B1, C1, and you did that update A1, and then B1, C1. What you actually did was replace the document. Right? So you need, to, you need to ensure that you're using the uh, uh, setup operations. I think there's, like most of the drivers have this uh, function called save, that is a complete replace. I think that's sort of an anti-pattern. I've been trying to like, convince my other engineers that you should get rid of the save thing because it just causes potential harm for the user. That said, there's at least two things you want to avoid when you're doing queries. Not in and not equals are really, really bad operations to run in a query. Mostly because the way databases work is that they usually have a B tree, and MongoDB has a B tree. And it's an inclusive index. So it only defines what is actually in the index. It doesn't have any information about what's outside of the actual B tree, right? So if you have an index that is indexing a set of, of, um, a set of uh, documents, uh, a B tree might only cover a part of it, right? It doesn't know anything about this. So it means that a not equal in or not equal needs to basically read through all of the documents to be able to satisfy the query. So if you have a big collection, this will cause a table scan. So there are uh, lots of ways of possibly rewriting your query to not to use this. But I definitely would not recommend using this. It's a very small collection maybe, but that's the same as the where it comes To get to this, I recommend the dash dash not table scan. If your query causes a table scan, it will error out. So this is like kind of uh, very rigid, like like uh, things. But I think these are incredibly useful if you're running uh, 
uh, some testing environment just to catch these kind of things that would cause you problems on scale. Um, yeah, and then like combining the no script thing to be the absolute hard ass. <laughs> <coughs> so we have lots of uh, customers who do this actually in production because they have very very some time sensitive queries. Scale generally is another uh, interesting problem. A lot of people just set up a shard, like from the start. And um, this is kind of bad, right? Because one of the things you don't want to do is define a shard key before you know the data access patterns in your application. Because once you shard, unsharding is extremely hard or extremely time consuming, and sometimes even near to impossible. Why? Because to reshard the data, you basically have to extract and reinsert all the data. Right? Because you basically have to distribute the data across a new shard key. So we definitely do not uh, recommend you start with a shard uh, until you actually know what your application needs in the sense of queries. <clears throat> and then like for me as a developer, what I always try to uh, explain to people, and it, it, this kind of hurts more for developers who start with uh, an ODM uh, like uh, Mongo Engine or Mongoid for or Ruby or something like that is that they normalize too early. So the hardest thing I think as a, when you work with MongoDB and I think in general document databases is you're used to modeling relational. And so your instinct is to decompose your objects into a, a completely normalized model. This actually is not very useful uh, for a document database because a document database has its strength when you are denormalized. So I usually try to tell people, think about the document as representing an object in your application, and then as you naturally evolve that object, you normalize. So you tell it from the other side, like you start in the normalized form and you normalize as needed. A typical example is like, you might have something like this, which is a blog post, you have a bunch of comments and you realize, well, there are some blogs that are extremely popular and I might have hundreds of thousands of comments. So, uh, and I also want to be able to range search across comments, okay? Right? I've, I've built my model and now figure out that I need to normalize. So you split it into two collections and you put the collections in a set, uh, the comments in a separate collection. So that's kind of like the thing. You start with something like this. It's, it's natural. It looks close to your object model. And then as you see the need, you <coughs> normalize. But normalize. And summary. Finding modify is one thing you should think about very, very carefully before using. No table scan, no scripting. You can start using right now. And at least uh, make sure that you are hitting the indexes if it's possible. Stevie.find and explain is like every developer's and ops person's like uh, best little helper when it comes to like figuring out what why queries are slow. The use power of size 2 and the command in 2.4 that I definitely recommend you use, especially if you have this particular situation where you're inserting, updating, and removing. Time to live indexes, definitely worth it as well. And then like just learning the difference between the right uh, using the right uh, right um, and read concern will have like lots of impacts on how your application scales. Questions? No? You can talk to me later. I'm not, I don't buy turn. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and that's it? Yeah. Okay.